We're delighted to have Maury Angel here tonight to speak about her adventures in colorful Columbia. Maury has been a great Remarkable Journeys travel companion. She's taking us on a number of journeys to Uzbekistan for one, Morocco also. Our last journey with her took us to Australia and Alaska as we learned some similarities that they shared. And tonight we get to join her as she tells us a little bit about the history, the culture, and the magic of colorful Colombia. This program was pre recorded. Maury and Constance will return at the end of the presentation for a question and answer period. So we're going to start in just a couple of seconds. So we're going to share the screen. Okay. Hello and welcome to Colorful Columbia, a presentation as part of the Remarkable Journeys program at the Napa County Library. My name is Maury Angel and I'm a photographer from Napa. I recently spent three weeks touring the South American country of Colombia, most of which was on a tour with a small group of my photography friends who I travel around the world with, and then a bit of it was a retreat with just one other friend for some post-tour R&R. Anyhow, the biggest question I always got when I told people I was going to visit Colombia was, why? It seems as though most of my friends only associate Colombia with two things, and they both start with the letter C. Coffee and cocaine. And they're not wrong. Both things have been integral to Colombia's reputation around the world. Its recent history of violent civil war, human rights violations, and powerful drug cartels are a fact. And pretty much everyone can say that they've enjoyed a delicious cup of Colombian coffee. So whether you think of the iconic Juan Valdez marketing campaign that put Colombian coffee on the map, or the headline-grabbing acts of violence spearheaded by notorious drug cartel leader Pablo Escobar, both have contributed to the perception of Colombia to outsiders. So even though I'm certainly no historian or any sort of authority on Colombia, this presentation will touch on both coffee and the dangerous 30-year era known as the Colombian conflict, but it will be in the context of the places that I visited. And I went to Colombia knowing that in recent years the country had seen a renaissance. I knew that cities were being reborn, there has been an active effort to root out corruption, and that there is a proactive push for tourism. And I can tell you that I never once felt unsafe. The country is absolutely stunning, and its people were kind, welcoming, and fun. The cities were sophisticated, and the nature is unparalleled. I would go back again in a heartbeat. That being said, my perspective is certainly a privileged one. I got to see some of the best of what the country has to offer. But in reality, Colombia still faces real challenges. There is widespread poverty, a very real social and racial class system, and drug trafficking is still very much rampant. But a few years ago, the Colombian Tourism Board started an aggressive international advertising campaign with the tagline, the only risk is wanting to stay. Take a look. There's a place where people never believed impossible was a word. A place where the breavers wanted to be an ocean, and the ocean grew weary of its solitude and joined the waterfall, the mountain, the snow peaks, and even another ocean. A place where the past lives harmoniously with the future, and the word infinity is written on the colors of the beach, the mountains, the jungle, and the sky. A place that challenges the imagination every single day. A place called Colombia. 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 El riesgo es que te quieras quedar. <laughs> So if the only risk to visiting Colombia is wanting to stay, I would have to agree. 
So let me show you a little bit about this country in photos and video. First, I'll go over a few quick facts about Colombia. Then I'll break down my itinerary and share with you some of the things I saw along the way. And then I'll end with a photo slideshow. So let's get started. First thing, geography. Colombia is located in the northwest corner of South America. It is a large country. It's more than one and a half times the size of Texas. Colombia shares a land border with five countries, including Panama, Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, and Peru. Colombia is the only country in South America with coastlines along both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, um, or the Caribbean Sea. In terms of biodiversity, Colombia is classified as a megadiverse country, ranking as the second most biodiverse country in the world after Brazil. Its territory encompasses Amazon rainforests, mountains, glaciers, grasslands, jungles, deserts, tropical beaches. It's got everything. About 50%, half of the country, is covered by forests. And there are 58 natural areas protected in the country, which is about 11% of the entire territory. With all of that natural splendor, ecotourism is definitely on the rise. Also, Colombia has the highest amount of species by area in the world, including the most endemic species of butterflies, the most orchid species, and the most amphibian species. When it comes to birds, they have more species of birds than all of Europe and North America combined. Colombia boasts 10% of all the species on Earth. Then let's talk about the fruit. <laughs> Don't even get me started. The variety of fruit that grows and is available in Colombia is astounding. It's fresh and it's available at every turn. They've got all the tropical fruit that you would expect, bananas and mangoes, pineapple, guava, papaya, but so many others that you've never even heard or seen before with names like granadilla or cherry moya. There are juice and smoothie stands on every corner. If you have a hankering for fruit, this is the place. In terms of cultural diversity, with over 50 million inhabitants, Colombia is the third most populous country in Latin America and it's the world's third most populous Spanish-speaking country. Its population is ethnically diverse, and it's got a rich multicultural heritage reflecting influences from its indigenous people, Spanish colonization, African slavery, and immigration from Europe and the Middle East. So where did I go? My journey began and ended in Bogota. Bogota is the capital of Colombia. It is home to 8 million people. It's the third largest city in South America. Bogota is also unique because it's located at over 8,600 feet above sea level. That makes it the fourth highest capital city in the world. It's also a huge city physically. It covers a total area of 613 square miles. We stayed in what's called the La Candelaria District. It's a historic neighborhood of Bogota, which is the city's vibrant heart and where the city actually began. It's full of narrow streets lined with shops and restaurants, and it's within easy walking distance to downtown. What was immediately striking about the neighborhood was all of the amazing murals, graffiti, and street art. I soon came to know that the street art scene throughout Colombian cities is incredibly vibrant, but it was in the La Candelaria neighborhood that I got my first glimpse of just how prolific it is. Regarding the street art and graffiti, uh, there's a definition of those two terms uh, to clarify why they're different. Graffiti is anything from scrawled, easily disregarded tags to huge tangled 3D letters covering greater expanses of wall space. Oftentimes, this may seem like or really may be vandalism. Street art, on the other hand, is any expression which takes place in the streets and which seeks to communicate an idea to society at large. 
They can take on the form of anything and everything from murals to live performance of any type, like music or dance. Needless to say, all of it is very prevalent in Colombia's large cities. In Bogota, graffiti has actually been decriminalized, which has contributed to its proliferation. This came about as a result of a tragedy. In 2011, police murdered a well-known 16-year-old street artist while he was tagging. Massive protests erupted throughout the city as a result, and the public uproar was partly responsible for the government relenting its stance and ultimately decriminalizing graffiti. Tagging is now no longer seen as crime. In Bogota, you can even take a graffiti walking tour to learn about some of the famous artists and their work. But if the open air street museum wasn't enough, there are other traditional museums and cultural centers in Bogota very much worth visiting as well. The first one I would recommend is the Botero Museum. Fernando Botero is a Colombian figurative artist and sculptor. His signature style depicts people and figures in large exaggerated volume and can represent political criticism or humor depending on the piece. He is considered the most successful living artist from Latin America. Then there is the Museo del Oro, or Gold Museum. It is the pride of Colombia. The museum displays a selection of relics from Colombia's indigenous cultures and contains the largest collection of gold artifacts in the world. No visit to Bogota is complete without heading to Monserrate. Monserrate is a mountain that dramatically frames the Bogota skyline. Its peak is higher than 10,000 feet, and at its summit, it's a striking white Catholic church that you can see from just about anywhere in the city below. The mountain was already considered sacred in pre-Columbian times when the area was inhabited by the indigenous Muisca people. Today, Catholicism is the main religion in Colombia, with an estimated 80% of the population identifying as Catholic. Another site within the city worth a visit is the Central Cemetery of Bogota. It is one of the main and most famous cemeteries in Colombia. It was opened in 1836, shortly after Colombia's break from Spain, and was declared a national monument in 1984. It's a place of history and religion, but also magic, miracles, and faith. Believers plea to the long dead for miracles. Certain grave sites are the object of veneration and superstition. Unfortunately for me, a large section of the cemetery was closed for maintenance when I was there, so I didn't get to see any of its most storied grave sites. But I do have a little video, so take a look. This is what the impressive cemetery looks like. There are also plenty of uh, historic and civic monuments worth a visit as well. Plaza Boulevard is the historic main square of Bogota and is located in the heart of the city. In this picture, you can see Monserrate up on the hill behind it. The square is surrounded within a few blocks by historic civic and cultural landmarks, including the nation's capital, the national cathedral, the Opera House, many more. Here's just a little video clip of the plaza. <laughs> Now 
Next, I want to share with you two of my very, very favorite places that I visited in Bogota. First up, and apologies for the pronunciation, I'm not sure if this is right, is the Palakimau Market. The Palakimau Market is the biggest and most active market in the city. You can find anything and everything here. Fresh flowers, fruit and vegetables, meat and seafood, durable goods, kitchenwares, anything, really. I'm a total sucker for a good local market. They are my favorite places to visit when I travel, not only because you get a glimpse into a culture, but mostly because they're always wonderful places to connect with people. Fair warning, you'll see loads of market photos in the slideshow to come. My next favorite activity in Bogota was an amazing Sunday tradition called Ciclovia. From 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. every Sunday and holidays since 1974, Bogota closes 76 miles of city streets to vehicle traffic. 76 miles, giving ample space for bicyclists and pedestrians to utilize the space. Impromptu markets, performers, and street food carts overtake the pavement. It's like a lively festival every single week. Some one and a half million people or more, or about a quarter of the city's population, turn out for it on average every week to exercise and socialize. It's an idea that has or is starting to catch on in other places around the world, even here in the Bay Area. Here's a short video of the activities on the streets during Ciclovia. <laughs> After Bogota, the next destination on my itinerary was a mountain getaway to a place called Villa de Leva. We traveled by coach and made two interesting stops along the way. The first was a place called the Salt Cathedral in a little town called Zipaquira. The Salt Cathedral is a church located 600 feet underground and made entirely of salt. The underground holy space began its life as something very different. It was a salt mine that was established in 1815. By 1932, generations of miners had carved out a small altar and sanctuary within the mine where workers would pray for protection each morning. In the early 1950s, they decided to make that small sanctuary into something bigger and began to carve a larger church out of the salt. It opened for worship and visitors in 1953 when the mine was still active. In 1990, however, the mine had been abandoned and the original Salt Cathedral was shut down due to structural problems that were deemed unsafe. Sculptors and miners then labored for four years to carve out an entirely new massive cathedral located 200 feet below the original. It opened in 1995 and has the capacity to hold 8,400 people at a time. It is considered an engineering marvel, and Colombians are very proud of it. The final stop before we reached Villa de Leva was a tiny village of Raquira, which is known for its pottery. The colors and patterns used in the town's fabrics and pottery are also seen in the town's architecture, including that of the central church. It's a very kitschy little town, but it's pretty cute and colorful. Now, I mentioned that our destination, Villa de Leva, is a popular mountain getaway. It was sort of like going to Tahoe is for us here in the Bay Area. But what mountains would that be? The mighty Andes, of course. There are three branches of the Andes mountain range, and Colombia is the northernmost point for all of them. There is a western, and a central, and an eastern range of the Andes in Colombia. Villa de Leva is nestled in the high country of the eastern range, in a valley surrounded on all sides by Andean peaks. Given its geography, Villa de Leva is temperate all year long. It doesn't really have seasons, but it does encompass four microclimates, including desert. As I mentioned, it's a popular vacation spot, especially for residents of Bogota, since it's only a couple of hours away. And the drive to get there 
from Bogota through the Andean high country is absolutely gorgeous. The most impressive feature of the town is Villa de Leva's huge central cobblestone plaza. It's called Plaza Mayor, and it's one of the largest town squares in all of the Americas. People gather there at all hours of the day, but it comes alive at night when people convene for drinks and music and socializing. The best thing about Villa de Leva, however, was just wandering the village. It has a wonderful weekly market where all the farmers from the region bring their wares. There's plenty of shops and restaurants lining the cobblestone streets, the activities and people watching on the plaza. It's just a cute, quaint, laid back place to be. I totally could see living there actually. We did do some sightseeing near Villa de Leva. We visited a Dominican monastery from the 1600s. We also visited an indigenous astronomical observatory and archeology span site. But the most interesting sightseeing we did near Villa de Leva was to a place called Casa Terracotta. Casa Terracotta is an earthen home made by a Colombian architect, artist, and environmental activist named Octavio Mendoza. The home is sculpted by hand, made entirely from clay that has baked in the sun. There is not an ounce of steel or cement in the structure, although Mendoza uses recycled iron and glass for fixtures and embellishments. If you're familiar with the artist Gaudi, the influence is undeniable. Mendoza continues to add to the building every single day, as he has for the past 14 years. Interest from locals and tourists to see the casa was so high, though, that he now allows tourists to visit, and he lives in a different cottage on the same property. After our mountain retreat to Villa de Leva, up next was the vibrant city of Medellin. Medellin is the second largest city in Colombia, home to two and a half million people. It is nestled in a valley of the central Andes mountain range. It is known as the city of eternal spring for its idyllic climate and also the city of flowers. Today, it is a city full of excellent museums, restaurants and concert halls, botanical gardens, parks, a university and more. The downtown area is modern and clean. In the 1990s, however, Time Magazine dubbed Medellin as the most dangerous city on earth. Indeed, it was the murder capital of the world. It was home to Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel. Escobar and the cartel had unleashed a wave of violence in the 1980s that would plague the city and Colombia for decades to come. Even after his death in 1993, crime rates remained high and paramilitary groups continued to destabilize the entire country. But today, Medellin is one of the great success stories of Latin America in terms of how locals have been transforming themselves and their city into a peaceful and innovative society. So what was the turning point? By and large, everyone agrees it was the infusion of money into public works, in particular, innovative public transportation when the city's metro was constructed in 1994, our local guide told us that it was the first positive thing that had happened in the city for decades. The metro started with a light rail system, still the only one in Colombia, but it now encompasses an entire network of rail transportation, different types of buses, and even aerial transportation like gondolas that ferry people up and down the hillside neighborhoods. And using the metro is cheap it only costs pennies to ride. With the metro, people realized that change was possible. Suddenly, it was easier to get around the city. People got out of their barrios, they went to work in different places from where they lived. The metro became a vast bridge joining far-reaching parts of the city. It helped to change the very psychology of that city. In February 2013, Medellin was named as the most innovative city in the world by the Urban Land Institute due to its advances in politics, education, and social development. And one of the most innovative neighborhoods in this now very innovative city is known as Comuna 13. There is no way for me to adequately describe Comuna 13. It's an enclave of 12 different barrios tucked high into the hillsides above the city proper. It is an area that just a few short years ago was considered a dangerous and isolated slum, but is now one incredible example of Colombia's urban transformation. 
Things began to change in 2002 when the Colombian president launched Operation Orion. It was a raid on Communa 13 and spearheaded by 3,000 troops backed by helicopters. It was a brutal and controversial beginning. Dozens of suspected criminals were killed or wounded and hundreds were arrested. The neighborhood's 100,000 residents were caught in the crossfire, resulting in arbitrary detentions, disappearances, and hundreds of injuries. During the decade that followed, however, the government set about improving Comuna 13 by redeveloping the brick houses and building community centers. But access to the neighborhood remained a problem. So in 2011, as part of Medellin's public transportation overhaul, the government installed the now famous Escalares Electricas, a series of six outdoor escalators that extend for over 1,200 feet up the hillside, connecting the once isolated neighborhood to the city below. Like the metro before it, the escalators gave residents newfound freedom and brought about a total shift in the local mentality. The result was the creation of one of the most colorful neighborhoods in Medellin, with vibrant street art decorating walls once riddled with bullet holes and houses painted to match. It's been a dramatic shift for Comuna 13, and tourists now come to ride the escalators, see the murals and street performers, eat in the flurry of new restaurants, and take in the expansive views of the city from the boardwalk. Transformation, rebirth, and hope are themes that come up again and again in Comuna 13, and visiting was one of the absolute highlights of my trip to Colombia. Here is just a very quick video of Comuna 13. The music for this clip is actually a recording of the music being played in the streets by one of the artists, the young, D the young DJ that is shown briefly in this footage. <laughs> Do it, the money. Do it, The turbulent past of Medellin is not one that is easily forgotten, nor should it be. There's a museum in Medellin called the House of Memory Museum that is dedicated to honoring the voices and stories of the victims of the violence that plagued Colombia for more than 30 years. It is a powerful and stirring museum, to be sure. The sculpture that's pictured here is called the Tree of Life, and it's located in a plaza adjacent to the museum. It is forged from over 27,000 melted weapons that were collected in the disarmament process in the neighborhoods of Medellin. It, along with the museum and much of the street art in the city, are reminders to never forget. After spending time in Medellin, my next Colombian adventure was about as polar opposite as you could get to the urban hustle and bustle. We set off to visit the area of Colombia known for its famed coffee plantations. Colombia is the number three coffee producer in the world after Brazil and Vietnam, so it is big business there and the livelihood of more than half a million families. To reach our destination for Medellin, it took a two-hour ride in a private coach, a 30-minute off-road jeep ride, and then a one-mile hike to reach this tiny coffee plantation high up in the Andes rainforest called Café de la Cima. Café de la Cima is a multi-generational farm where everything is done by hand. We spent the day there doing everything from harvesting coffee beans and learning about the roasting process to having a delicious homemade meal and soaking up the views. In fact, from that farm, you can see the mountain peak that is part of the Juan Valdez logo. 
The Juan Valdez logo has long been a symbol of quality and authenticity of Colombian coffee. Coffee producers have to meet certain quality standards in order to use this logo in their marketing. And of course, we tried lots and lots of coffee through an extensive coffee tasting, similar to a wine tasting here in Napa Valley. The next stop of my Colombian adventure was the picturesque and historic Caribbean city of Cartagena. It is a major port city, as well as a very popular beach and tourist destination. Its historic walled city center is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Cartagena was settled in 1533 by Spain due to its location on the Atlantic Ocean. It was strategic for both trade and defense. During the Spanish colonial period, Cartagena served a key role in administration and expansion of the Spanish Empire. It was a center of political and economic activity. As with other places in the Americas, Spain colonized the area by displacing indigenous peoples who had lived there since 4000 BC. Cartagena was also the epicenter for the Colombian slave trade. So Colombia's beginnings are not unlike our own. We stayed within the historic walled city center. It's the central hub of all tourist activity, but we did venture beyond that to a few places where tourists don't generally go. To learn more about Colombia's history of slavery, we took a day trip to the village of San Basilio de Palenque. It is considered the first free slave town in all of the Americas. It was founded in the early 1600s by the son of an African king who had been sold into slavery. The Spanish crown issued a decree in 1691, officially freeing the Africans in Palenque from slavery. The village doesn't appear in many guidebooks and few tourists take the time to visit, but perhaps like other emerging destinations in Colombia, this is perhaps changing. The village sees tourism as their way to an economic future. The former slaves in Palenque and every generation since have maintained many of their African oral and musical traditions, including their own unique language known as Palenquero, the language is recognized as the only Spanish-based Creole language that exists in the world. UNESCO has named the village a World Heritage Site solely for the purpose of preserving the language and its accompanying musical traditions. Here's a video clip that will give you a flavor for the unique sound of the language and the music. <laughs> Lo que a mí me sucedió, ahora le vengo a contar. Lo que a mí me sucedió, ay no cumpliste la palabra de Morena, el papel se me rompió. Ay no cumpliste la palabra de Morena, el papel me se rompió. Mírala como baila, peradita de los hombres. The other place off the beaten track that we visited while in Cartagena was a local market called El Mercado de Baserto. As I told you earlier, I love local markets and this one absolutely blew my mind. It is the largest market in Cartagena where you can, again, find anything within its labyrinth of aisles and shops. You can find anything that is except for tourists. It's located outside of the walled city in very much a slum area. It is definitely off the beaten path. The late author and chef Anthony Bourdain chronicled his visit to Bizerto in 2012 in an episode of No Reservations on the Travel Channel. He ventured there with a guide to eat at one of the many food stalls called Cecilia's, we ate at Cecilia's as well. Here's the clip from his show. 
The Sorto, the seemingly independent city-state within a city. Another world for a look at a seemingly endless variety of sea creatures. This is Picuda. This is Sierra. Oily, lot of uh, fat. Yes, yes, yes. This is squid, pata de burro, donkey. Donkey foot. foot. Yeah. This is very common too, the sabalo. Remarkably fresh. Red snapper. And barely a refrigeration unit in sight. It's an extravaganza, can I use that word? A cornucopia, a rainbow of fruits, most of which I've never even heard of. The smell is heavy and sweet. Delicious, huh? Mango, 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 mango. Five types of mangoes, four kinds of oranges, three kinds of clementinas, limon, toronja, lime, pomelo. This is very special, like a mandarin mixed with lime. Delicious. Very dark. Try this. What do you call it? Caimito. Caimito. That's a pleasure to eat. Man, this is nice. Yes. It's very like a custard apple. This is really something special. I could spend all day here, or at least a little longer, but Jorge tells me that you haven't really tasted the market without visiting someone special. Okay, let's go to Cecilia. Okay. That's if we can find it. Oye, ¿dónde está Cecilia? Abajo. Seguro. Stall upon stall. A maze, a labyrinth, which many of the estimated 7,500 workers rarely leave. What we're looking for deep in the market is someplace good to eat. A joint where market workers can grab a bite, or many bites. You know, it's a little difficult to find you sometimes. People like that. This is alive, you know? Sure, sure, sure. This is a special place. I think we are close. Cecilia, hola mi amor, ¿qué tienes hoy? Finally, the promised land. Cecilia's specials of the day. So this is seafood rice, chicken, fish. Man, it looks good. It smells good. What is it? It's turtle? Turtle, yes. With what kind of eggs? A quail egg? Or? Turtle eggs. Turtle eggs. Years before, we just look outside, you know, like the French food, the Spanish food. Ah, that's really interesting. Uh, now we're looking inside. We're looking inside. Oh man, that's delicious. Yeah. Another huge highlight of Cartagena for me was getting a chance to see and photograph one of the small number of elusive wild sloths that live in the treetops of one of the parks. That might actually be the most memorable thing of the trip for me, getting to watch this female three-toed sloth on the move between the branches of the trees was absolutely phenomenal. Here's a video of her on the move. The last place on my Colombian itinerary was the tiny little mountain village of Minca. This is the juncture where I departed company with the photography group and one friend and I took off for the hills to spend our last few days in the jungle. We stayed in a treehouse far from anything it, and that was an adventure all in its own. But Minka is considered a sleepy hidden gem perched at the top of a mountain in Colombia's dramatic Sierra Nevada mountain range. It is known as a hiking and bird watching destination and it really caters to backpackers. And so that's what we did. We went bird watching, we hiked, we rode on the backs of motorbikes through the jungle, we dipped our toes in the cool rivers, and we took in the scenery. We also got eaten alive by bugs, didn't have hot running water, said sayonara to the internet, and had to shoot a cockroach out of our treehouse that was, I'm not kidding, the size of the palm of my hand. It flew away like a bird. I was so astounded that I didn't take a picture, and that's the only regret I have from this whole trip. We ultimately retreated to the bigger city of Santa Marta, located an hour away on the Atlantic coast, a day ahead of schedule due to a dramatic overnight windstorm that felt and sounded as though it would topple our treehouse at any moment. It also knocked out power to the entire mountainside. In Santa Marta, we treated ourselves to hotel rooms, hot showers, lazy time at the pool, and scrumptious meals. It was the perfect end to the Colombian adventure. So that is where my journey came to an end. I hope that you enjoyed learning about Colombia and some of the sites that I got to visit. To wrap up this presentation, please enjoy this eight minute photo slideshow of some of my favorite images from the trip. 
Thank you for joining me. And until next time, adios. ¿Y qué pasó? Siempre está de fiesta, siempre está de rumba Barranquilla siempre tiene un buen motivo para festejar Tremendo swing Barranquilla tiene un swing Pero tremendo swing Que empieza la rumba y no tiene fin Barranquilla tiene un no sé qué Va a bailar la cumbia, cuya y más palé Y sus mujeres en descaderado se ven tan divinas Moviendo la cola al compás de una cumbia que fascina Es que Barranquilla es una ciudad tan maravillosa Que todo el mundo quiere gozar aquí en la arenosa Oye que sí, Barranquilla tiene un fin Por eso yo me quedo en Barranquilla Quien lo vive, quien lo goza Y si el junio mete un bola y un arrebato Se prende Barranquilla con todos sus barrios en el 84 ¡Vaya que rico!
questions so I will start um, somebody asked how did you begin to even plan a journey like that that's a good question um, travel agents for sure and the benefit of going with the group is that the group itinerary is planned so um, I travel with the group and uh, our mighty travel agent who might be even on this presentation. Uh, he's also a photographer, so he does it for a living and he organizes these in tandem with uh, guides local to the country and cities where we travel. So in these groups of 10, 10 to 12 people or so, it, it definitely always starts with a, an agent working with local guides. And then from there, because I always make an extension and stay longer or do different things, um, I do my own research about where I would want to go in addition to what's on the itinerary for the group and then make sure I hit it. 
Okay, great. Um, somebody did ask if the re this presentation will be recorded and accessed later. And yes, you can get it off of, um, it's posted on our, um, on the Napa Library website. So you'll be able to find that. It'll take about a week or so, but um, you should be able to look that up and find it and be able to watch it and share it. Um, uh, somebody asked, do you speak Spanish or feel, did you speak Spanish or feel the need to? And when did you travel to Colombia? Good question. Hi, Joan. Um, I was in Colombia basically um, January of 2020 for three weeks, um, a little bit in December, but mostly through January. So it was the winter here um, pre COVID. So all those crowds, I mean, none of this would even happen these days, I imagine. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was a year ago from now. And uh, the weather, you asked also about the weather. It, it was interesting because it rained quite a bit in Medellin and in, um, in Bogota, mm -hmm. but it was never cold. It was never cold, maybe just a jacket or a raincoat. But then when you got to the coast in Cartagena, it was very tropical, very hot, very sultry. Just a typical uh, like Caribbean mm. type of, of weather, so. Okay, and did you speak Spanish or did you feel you Oh, Spanish, to speak? no, I speak not a lick of Spanish. <laughs> um, in fact, I apologize to all the Spanish speakers out there watching the presentation and me butchering all the language. Um, I'm more familiar and more fluent in French. I read French pretty well, so, my problem is always seeing or reading or hearing Spanish and wanting to answer in French. So I have a real problem with Spanish, but I, get, I know enough to get by. So, um, and gesturing and smiling goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And in Colombia, a lot of people spoke English. And in addition, in most, well, in all the places with the group, we had a local guide who, um, was always able to help interpret or ask things for us, things like that. So um, I'm a huge believer in getting local guides and I do that personally too on extended travels, um, just because the knowledge that you can gain from uh, a local guide and plus have an interpreter and somebody to explain customs even, things like that. I find that really important. So I always like to have a local guide. So if you're um, interested in going to Columbia, I can connect you with our guide who was um, amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, somebody asked, did the US contribute money for the reconstruction uh, in Medi Medellin as part of the anti-drug program? No, I'm, I'm not aware that they did. I'm, I, I mean, and that's just going on what I know. I'm pretty sure it was all an infrastructure program by the Colombian government and the Colombians are quite proud of it and the infusion of money and resources that the federal government of Colombia put toward Medellin's revitalization. So it's all uh, Colombian money as far as I know. Okay, uh, another question. Um, I'm working on a possible trip to South America. How does Colombia compare cost-wise as opposed to other destinations? I've, I have found that, well, Colombia was very affordable, very, very affordable um, in relation to places like Chile or Argentina that are a bit more expensive. Chile's quite expensive, um, or like if you wanted to go to Galapagos, extremely expensive. Um, but Colombia is super affordable. Um, the amount of places we were able to go is a testament to that because um, everything was pretty affordable and even you know staying on our own and traveling independently. Um, transportation was reasonable. Flights within the country are very reasonable. So, I found it very, very affordable. And the exchange rate was really favorable a year ago too. So our dollar went quite a long way. Um, someone asked, did you go to, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna say this wrong. Chicken care, chicken care, chicken care. We did not. 
<laughs> we drove through there, like just uh, from Bogota to Medellin. Um, and I want to say that might be, no, that's not where the Salt Cathedral is, but no, I didn't spend any time there. Okay. Okay, and so we want to know, are any of your earlier programs accessible? Um, I know you've done some with us. They're probably on our website. I don't know. Perhaps I, I definitely I answer, answer that. Answer that. <laughs> um, we actually did not start recording um, any of the programs until COVID and when we started using the Zoom format. So prior to that, it was an in-house presentation and Maury would come to our community meeting room and uh, present. And so those were not recorded, but they were fabulous too. I do have them all. So if you're interested in any of the countries that uh, were mentioned earlier, just reach out to me, get my email and I can share them with you. You can, I mean, I've got loads of presentations available. Okay, we have a couple very nice compliments. Great presentation. Thank you. Especially love the ending slideshow. Fabulous people shots. And then someone asked, are you selling your photography? Sure. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get in touch. How with do you, you think I pay for these trips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh, somebody was saying Chikunkira is where the Salt Cathedral is. Yeah, so it, it is. Um, so really our only stop there was to go to the Salt Cathedral and um, to have lunch. And so I typically begged out on all of the meals and opted to walk the streets instead. So that's the only chance I got to see the little village, which wasn't long at all. Okay. And... Uh... Someone wanted to know if they could contact you via email. Um, what camera? What camera do you use? What is? What was your camera? And I I shoot with Canon uh, 5D Mark II um, and a variety of lenses uh, depending on the situation, but one camera body and all natural light and travel photography, so no elaborate setup at all. Mm -hmm. Um, the woman who was a asking about the cathedral, she said her grandmother, this is Irina Rozo, her grandmother worked at the cathedral as a child in the salt mines at 12. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a piece of information. That, wow. I believe it. And the salt mine is super interesting. I mean, you can hold all these people, but I can tell you that I think that would make me quite nervous to go there for a service when it was that packed. I guess it gets really packed for like Easter, of course, any of the holidays, um, because there's one entrance and it's the same exit. There's only one way in and one way out. And <laughs> I don't know, with that many people, it, it probably would make me a bit claustrophobic and I'm not claustrophobic. So. Yeah, and she says her grandpa became a stone sculptor. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. It's neat to see that connection from our people in our community to, you know, but. Yeah. So some of my fellow travelers came to this presentation. So hi, Juan, David. <laughs> and I think that is all the questions we have. Great. Tonight. So I will turn it over to back to Stefana. People well, always that was say, fabulous, really oh, wonderful. Yeah. I don't know how anybody could sit still for that last <laughs> you know, just little chair it was wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. And I want to um, remind everybody that next month on Thursday, March 18 at 7 p.m., Sasha Paulson brings us whale watching in Baja, California. So mark it on your calendar. We'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night.